Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, our hymns and our scripture speaks to us of finding a home in Jesus and making room in the home of our hearts for Jesus. So I want to begin uh, with a story. It's a story about Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash, two country western singers uh, you may know of. Uh, Johnny Cash uh, recorded his first prison concert. So he was he had these two albums that were recorded inside the walls of uh, a prison. The first one, second one was Folsom. So, uh, the first one was in San Quentin. And when Johnny Cash went, uh, he played in San Quentin. And in the audience was a young man who had been, as he describes himself, a wayward soul who was lost uh, in crime and drugs and alcohol. But when he saw Johnny Cash on stage playing... He knew that there was redemption for himself. He knew that he could play uh, guitar and that he would devote his life from that moment forward to getting out, getting clean, getting sober, and playing music for the rest of his life. For him, this was a, a, a moment of great change, personal inward change. His name was Merle Haggard. Now, he kept, so Merle gets out, and indeed, that's what he does. Many of you probably know he was one of, at that time, one of the top country western singers. He, he had one album, I think, that had five hits on it uh, alone. He was very famous. But he had kept from his fans and the, the newspapers and everything the fact that he had served in prison. So nobody in the public knew this fact about himself and yet as he describes it it was eating him up like he had this secret that he had now kind of overcome but he was afraid to tell people about his true self well johnny cash at the time who had been kind of following merle haggard's career some of you may remember johnny cash had a very popular network television show and so he would invite famous artists of different kinds really to come on the show and then he would play with them and so he invited Merle Haggard on the show now you can imagine the backstage of the show as everybody's getting ready and uh, Johnny Cash comes up to Merle it's right before they go on stage it's just minutes it's just minutes and Merle confesses to Johnny Cash what had happened and he says when you came and recorded that first Album. I was in the audience because I was serving time. And he says, I haven't ever told anybody about it because I'm afraid of what will happen to me. Johnny looked at him and said, well, if you will allow me, I will tell everybody in my introduction tonight on national TV that you were in the audience in San Quentin. You had a redemption moment. Here you are today, clean, sober, playing guitar with me. And he says, when I do that, nobody will be able to say anything about it. It'll be over. And because of his own sobriety, Haggard says that he thought to himself, there's nothing like honesty to clean things up. And that he never, he says in thinking about it, has never regretted the fact that he gave Johnny permission to go out and tell the story. He's never been sorry. Now here's the thing. 
They then sang this song, which some of you may know by other artists because it's been covered a number of times. The warden led a prisoner down the hallway to his doom. He stood up to say goodbye like all the rest. And I heard him tell the warden just before he reached my cell, let my guitar playing friend do my request. Sing me back home with a song I used to hear. Make my old memories come alive. Take me away and turn back the years. Sing me home. Sing me back home before I die. In the story of these two men, we have an example, don't we? Of someone who prepares a home within himself and another person who redeems him. Like who comes and says, let me lift the burden of the shame of what you've done. You've cleaned yourself up. Now let me lift the shame of that so you don't have to deal with that. This is what our passage is speaking to us today. Lives freed from shame and guilt of what is past. Lives lived the wrongs and the broken promises and the pains felt and doled out, the words we said, the words we wish we could take back. But these are lifted <laughs> by the Christ who's coming, says John the Baptist, by Zephaniah who pro- prophesies this and says, the judgments against us have been taken away. As the prophet, our, our fear of disaster has been relieved such that we will not bear reproach and we shall exalt in love says the prophet. Imagine that. that I, I had that sense that that must be what Merle Haggard felt in that moment of redemption on the stage, right before they sing the song about going home. The prophet Zephaniah continues, God will save the lame, gather the outcasts, change their shame into praise. And then he says, God will bring them home. God will bring them home. Now, I don't know about you all, but (laughs) this all sounds good on Sunday morning, but it's hard to remember the rest of the week. (laughs) Right? Am I wrong about that? No, I find it hard. I mean, and I have to do this professionally. (laughs) Right? But the busyness of the week, just like I'm starting out good. I'll be good for the next couple of hours. And then I'm going to get on the road and drive and it'll just go away. All of this thought of goodness and grace and everything else and then that shame will come on me right because you and I both know that that we we carry with us the burdens of those sorrows that we create and some of us carry those burdens for many years don't we things that you may have said to a mother or father long before they ever died but you never righted that wrong Things that happen between you and a sibling or cousin or aunt that has broken that relationship forever. We all have the stories. There actually is no shame in it because it's normal, right? I mean, it's normal for us to have these lives that are broken. And that's the point of the gospel that John's proclaiming is we all have it, right? The priests have it. The tax collectors have it. All these sinners. People, everybody's coming out to see John the Baptist. They all know they have it. In this society today, we hide it. Right? We, and this is why it's so difficult for us because we compare, as we say in our house to our daughters all the time, we compare our insides to other people's outsides. And so we don't see the broken hearts, the broken homes. We can hear God calling and inviting us to change this, but we don't really know what to do. So I'm going to tell you, It's Advent. We're in the third Sunday of Advent. There are candles. We have two weeks to Christmas. Okay, and Advent is a time of preparing, right? We're supposed to be like getting ready for Christmas. Now, all good Christians start out Advent with the best things in mind. They're going to get an Advent wreath and say prayers, and that lasts two weeks. So we're already a week into forgetting all about Advent and getting ready for Christmas in a different way, right? So this is what happens, right? I mean, just that's normal, even in the bishop's house. It's normal. And then you kind of get to, you get to Christmas 
And then you're like, well, maybe I'll light the fourth candle earlier so it burns down a little bit and nobody will notice that we didn't do the third and fourth weeks, right? So I just set that aside for a second. I mean, those are good practices because they bring the light into the home. I mean, there's lots of goodness there. But that's not what I want you to do, okay? I want to invite you to be Johnny Cash for somebody in the next two weeks. I want you to be like John the Baptist, Christ. I'm shooting low. I'm going to take one win in two weeks from you all. Okay, <laughs> like one. If you hit it early, you're going to be tempted to do two and three and four. Okay, <laughs> right? So just go for it. Just know that you would just make my heart sing if you got four out. Thing. But this is it. This is what happens. We all get worried. It's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I've got to find... No. Your work is simply to say the bishop has invited me to do something. To say something that relieves somebody's burden. You don't even have to do anything. We're just talking about speaking a little bit of love, a little bit of hope into somebody's life when they don't have any. Okay. I guarantee if you will just... Listen and look for two weeks. Somebody is going to present themselves. So you might every day when you get up ask, who will, will there be somebody today? That might help you just to kind of hit that when, you, when you're leaving. But it could be a friend at school. It could be a workmate. It could be somebody at the coffee shop. It could be a clerk, somebody who's selling you something. Who knows? But I guarantee if you will listen and be attentive, somebody's gonna tell you they're having a bad time. And what all I'm asking you to do is to love on them. Listen, you don't have to solve their problems. If you can do something, great. But what I'm really saying is help them find a little bit of home, a little bit of home in Jesus and in themselves. And you don't even have to use Jesus' name. You can just love on him. And I promise you, if you'll do that, if you will try that experiment, two weeks, you, you guys got it easy. You don't even have to do the whole Advent. It's just two weeks. You just, boy, the people on the first, they got it tough from me because I asked them to do a whole bunch of stuff. But now I'm just down for hoping for this. But if you will do it, then I, I tell you two things will happen. One is a person who's suffering will hear a kindly word that will lift their spirits. Maybe even just for a few minutes. But they will know, even if it's just for a few moments, that they are loved, worthy of that love, and worthy of belonging to a family greater than themselves alone. And you, you will have discovered that in doing this, you have actually opened a place and made a home for Jesus inside of your heart where Christ can dwell and speak out of you. And that, my friends, is going to change the way you think about and receive Christmas this year. I get one person. It will change you. And it will make a difference about the Christ who comes in human form to save us and to take us home. So sing me back home with the song I used to hear. Make my old memories come alive and take me away and turn back the years. Sing to me, sing me home before I die. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.